having someone else fix them for you. So we're going to start today by so talking about how you solve a differential equation that looks like this. Okay, initial value problem. Okay, function is nonlinear. We want to be able to solve this, um, but we can't solve it analytically. So I'm going to talk about different ways to solve it, um, introducing so-called Euler methods, in case you're wondering how that's pronounced. Um, <laughs> finite difference methods, which I want to introduce kind of a little more generally. And then some more advanced methods. In fact, this Runga Kutta was one. You remember I gave you the, all the MATLAB functions? The last column said, what's the algorithm? And a couple of them said Runga Kutta, for example. Okay. And then some advanced topics, so-called multi-step and adaptive step size. Okay. All right. So I've said all this already, but I'll just say it again. Um, if you have a system and it's a linear set of differential equations, all you have to do is find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this. Hope they're distinct, right? So the, col the eigenvectors are linearly independent. And then you can solve it. We've done that. And you've had homeworks on that. Um, so that's no problem. And we also learned, this thir the third thing here is you can learn something about the qualitative properties of the nonlinear system, like whether it's stable or not by linearization. It's not a solution. I didn't tell you how to solve this. I just told you I, how you can check whether a steady state is stable or not. That's not solving it. Okay. I think in um, you take differential equations class. Uh, if I if same thing my, like my differential equation class, they just roll out equation, different equation after different equation, and tell you how to teach you to solve them. This is integrating factors. This is separable. This is exact. Does this raise a bell? Okay, um, and that's great. But very few real equations look like the ones you're solving. <laughs> At least, I won't, I won't say never, but most, equ most equations you solve aren't going to fall within the framework of integrating factors and separable and things like this. Okay? So most equations you, you're going to get, models that you're going to develop, have to be solved numerically. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. And so what I'm going to do is just try to give you the rudimentary stuff. Right? Um, we're going to start with the assumption, which is reasonable. You never want to write your own code and do, write it, do anything if you can avoid it. Okay? So like when you're in MATLAB, the last thing in the world you want to do is write your own code to solve an equation. That's what MATLAB does, right? So that's what I'm, tr I'm not trying to get you to write your own codes, but I'm trying to get you to understand when things don't work. Like if you don't have any idea how MATLAB, you know those messages MATLAB gives you. Like if you don't have any idea how MATLAB works, you'll have no idea what those messages mean and even if it worked, okay? So that's, I'm trying to give you enough knowledge to be functional. All right, so let's talk about Euler methods. So let's say you have that initial value problem written up at the top. So f is a nonlinear function. It can depend both on the independent variable x and independent variable y. We have an initial condition. We want to integrate this equation forward in x, okay, S from some initial condition. Usually we're not going to be able to do it analytically. So here's how conceptually all these methods work with some modifications. Is that we're going to Instead of computing the solution, like, what do we mean by solution to this equation? We mean this, y of x, right? If you wanted an analytical solution, you'd want me to give you y of x, how y depends on x, okay? So rather than do that, what I'm going to be willing to do is tell you what I think y is at a certain discrete values of x, okay? So like, I'm going to take this x, this independent variable, and I'm going to discretize it. Okay, x0 is the, is the value of the initial condition, okay? I'm gonna, we know the value there because we're given it. The next thing I'm going to do is try to give you a, a value of y at the point x1. That's a little bit bigger than x0. How much bigger depends on this thing h. h is called the step size, okay? And then I'm going to give you the value at x2, which is the initial condition plus 2h, and so on and so forth. So it's going to look something like this. So here's y, here's x, okay. So here's 0, and here's a point I call x1. It's, this distance here is h, okay. Here's a point x2, also separate by h3, okay. And what I'm going to try to do is generate an algorithm that gives me the value. I'm given this value here, let's call it the initial condition. And then I'm going to try to compute the value there, and there, and there. And if I, commute, if I, if I uh, calculate enough of these values, 
like a hundred of them, not like three, a <laughs> hundred, then you know you can connect these with a line. It's going to look like a continuous solution, right? You have to you have to have a lot of them. So this H has to be relatively small. So like if you had a chemical reactor, let's say, you know, I already showed you this so-called plug flow reactor thing where reaction takes place down the length of the reactor, which here we'll call X to be consistent. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to discretize this reactor into little pieces like this, and I'm going to compute the solution at each point, and then I'm going to draw a line between all those points to get what looks like a continuous solution. To do that, I might want to discretize this in like 100 points. Right? I want this reactor to have be partitioned into 100 different points or something like that. Okay. So this process is called discretization of the model. Okay? And for shorthand notation, I'm going to call the value of y at the point x1, this point to be y1, the value at y at x2 to be y2. So this doesn't mean y is a vector <laughs> with different components, and this is the same, the value of the one variable y at different points x, okay? y1, y2, y3, and so on. Okay. So this is my goal. I want to generate these values y1, y2, and y3, but I have to come up with an algorithm to do it. And the simplest ones are called Euler methods, okay? So you can, you can go about deriving this in several different ways. Let's, let's do the first way, which is do a Taylor series expansion, okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm writing a Taylor series expansion of the point, um, a Taylor series expansion of the uh, function y, because right, y is a function of x. And this Taylor series expansion tells me how I can compute y at x plus h from y at x, right? So there's the first term in the Taylor series expansion, second one is the second derivative, third one is the third, <coughs> sorry, third term is second derivative, and so on and so forth, okay? So when we use these Euler methods, what we're going to do is basically throw away the higher order terms, which means terms that are second order and higher, and then we're going to get something that looks like this, right? So this is the same equation as on the previous page, except I eliminated all the higher order terms. That's why I have an approximation there now, okay? All right, so we know what dy dx is because from the original equation, sorry to do this to you, it's f of x, okay? So I'm just substituting f of x in right there, okay? So you can use this kind of like when we did, you remember we did the iterative methods for solving nonlinear algebraic equations. I would come up with an equation, then I would kind of convert it into an iterative equation. So I'm going to do the same kind of thing here. So if we look at this equation, you could say, for example, let's consider x equal x0, okay? So if x is x0, we call that thing y0, then we'd evaluate this function at x0 and y0, you get that. And this would be x0 plus h. I hate to do this to you again, but x0 plus h is what we call x1, okay? So this gives you a way to compute y1 if you know y0. You know x0 and y0, well, you know y0 because that's the initial condition, and you know x0 because you, you, you choose all the x's yourself, okay? So this is nothing more an application of the initial condition. Compute the function, multiply it times um, h, add on the value of y, get a, new, get a value of y1. y1 means you've now taken this value and you just computed <coughs> this value right there, y1. And so you might imagine I can do the same thing. I can take the solution for y1, plug it in this equation, put in x1, y1 there, y1 there, get y2. Okay, and that'll give me this thing there. So generally speaking, you can do what's shown in this iterative equation here. If I give you xn and yn, this equation allows you to compute yn plus 1. Okay? And so you always have a place to start, right, because you, you have an initial condition. So you start with the initial condition, compute y1, then take y1 and plug it back in with its corresponding value x1, get y2, and just keep going until you're done, okay? Then you can compute all these points. If you compute a lot of them, you can um, connect them up and they'll look smooth, as you'll see soon. Okay, and this kind of gives you, uh, one thing I don't like about the, the book, I like the book. It's uh, encyclopedic, I like that, right? It's really thick, it's got everything in there. Um, it doesn't have a lot of graphics and conceptual pictures that help you understand things. Here's one of the rare cases where it does, okay? So it's, it's a giving you a graphic illustration of um, 
Ah, Euler's method. So right, we're starting at x0. You have a value of y there called y0. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the slope, right? The slope of the, fun the, slope of the function is f, right? Because it's dy dx equals f. So you take the slope at that point, go up to the new value x1, and that's your value y1. So that's just a graphic interpretation of that equation right there. Okay? And then with y1, take the slope again, multiply that times h, you'll end up at y2 and so on. Okay? So you see the circles here are the, your solution. And um, that solid line, even though it's not telling you what it is, that's the true solution. Hopefully you can see that, th that this procedure is not going to give you the true solution. But it's probably going to give you a really good solution if this h is really, really small. Because if this h is really small, then you're doing this many, many, many times, and you'll be able to keep up with the curvature of that solution. Okay? So h small is good in principle. Okay? All right. So I don't know how much time I want to spend on this, but this is some measure of how good a method this is. So, so if someone says, OK, here's a method. And then uh, let me say, there's probably hundreds of different methods at least to do this. So someone says, here's one method. You want some measure if this method is any good. What do you mean by good? Is it accurate? Like, you can see what's going to happen here is you're going to keep deviating from the solution, right? You're going to go like this in the real solution. So there's going to be an error developed between your solution and the actual solution. And so you, you want some measure of how big that error is going to be, and that's what this is trying to tell you here. Okay. So this is from trend, what is that famous? Ah. Is it the midpoint theorem? I, I, can't, uh, I can't remember where this comes from. <laughs> I'll think of it in a minute, though. So this, is, this tells you that the actual value of y equals the things that you included in your equation plus something you've not included in your equation. Okay. So there exists a I, I always call this squiggly. In the control class, we use squiggly a lot. And usually every time I say it for the first 20 times, people giggle. And then after about the thousandth time, nobody's giggling anymore. All right. But for now, feel free to giggle. There exists a squiggly between x and x plus h that makes this an equality. I don't know why I can't remember. This is a very famous theorem in mathematics that allows you to do this. Um, and that we have not included. So that cr not including that creates an error. And what you say is it creates an error of order h squared, right? Because the term we're neglecting is of order h squared, right? Because the Taylor series expansion of term h squared, h cubed. So, um, so the local error, every time you do this calculation, you introduce an error like this, OK? And so that says it's, order, it's, an, it's an error of order h squared. You can see why it's good to have h small, right? Because if h is small and you square it, this error will be smaller. So small h is good. Now, that's called the local error, because every time you do this calculation, you introduce a, an error like that. If you, the global error means how much error are you going to do when you do this repeatedly. That ends up being order h. So it's, it's a worse error, because you don't do it just once. You do it multiple times, and that, that actually makes it a worse error, right? Because you get a little deviation every time you do this. But the, if you look here, the deviation is growing. And so that's called the global error, OK? So this is actually the worst possible method to use. There's no method that's less accurate than this. But it's introduced first because it's the easiest to understand than the other methods. Okay. All right. So let's see how you actually would do this on a little toy problem. So this is an example I did in this lecture here. Remember? You probably don't remember the example. But I, if you don't remember, where I, I didn't make it up. It comes from an example. It comes from mixing two streams together. Okay? And what I did was I, get, I got an equation for the mass fraction of so one of the two components coming out of the exit stream. And it depended on the flow rate and composition of the inlet streams, also, as well as the density of the fluid, cross-sectional area of the tank. Okay? And so what I've assumed in this example, which I don't think I assumed in the previous one, but I don't remember, is the level is constant, so constant volume. Go back and look. You'll see you get this equation. Okay? I want to solve this equation. Now, you might say, I know how to solve that, because it's linear. <laughs> but this is for sake of illustration. Okay? So I'm not proposing you have to solve this numerically. This is a linear differential equation in 8x3, right? So this is a non-homogeneous linear differential equation. We know how to solve that. But I'm just saying, let's just see how we'd apply the method to this example. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write this derivative 
like this. Okay, let me see. It's not quite how I explain. It's the same. It's the same thing, but it's not quite how I explain it. But anyway, um, so let's see if you agree with me on this one. Okay, so here's a derivative. Well, actually, let's just start with this. <laughs> let's just start with this because that's what I did before. Okay. I said, if we want to solve this equation, right? So this looks, excuse me if I go back a moment. I know people hate that, but um, seems like I'm missing a slide. Probably not. OK. So I get, oh, there we go. So I want to implement an equation like this. So it says, if you want to implement this, you need to just take the step size that you want to use, multiply it times the right-hand side. Add that to yn and get yn plus 1. That's this equation here, right? There's the right-hand side. Multiply that by the step size. Just to confuse you, I called that delta t instead of h because I want to keep you alert, all right? Add that on to the value at n and get the stop. Sorry, n plus 1, OK? So you see the way this works is that I give you, well, we'll see it in a minute. I give you the initial value of this, the initial condition, that value right there. I give you all these numbers like w1, x1, so on and so forth. I give you the delta t, and then you can just iterate this equation and generate the solution, or an approximate solution. So here's some parameters. I made these up. Flow rate of the first stream and, and um, <laughs> well, Let's just say, let's not interpret these x's to be mass fractions, OK? Because um, I chose one to be four, OK? So apparently, I've decided to use different units here. It doesn't really matter for the sake of what we're doing. But so uh, here's for the first stream, second stream. And this appears in the denominator as a multiplicative, so I just call that thing two. And then if you plug all that in, so you take these parameters and you plug it into this equation, you'll get this iterative equation here, OK? So you see what you have to do is have an initial condition for x3, right? That corresponds to n equals 0. Plug it in here, cr crank through this equation, then you'll get x3 comma 1. The first index is the variable, right? We called it x3. And the second index is which iteration you're doing. So it's a little confusing, but. So plug in the value for n equals 0 and get the value for n equal 1. Then take that thing, plug it back in, get the value for n equal 2, and so on. So I'm going to start with an initial condition where there's no x3 in the tank. Okay. So initial condition is there's fluid in the tank, but there's no, none of the component A or whatever that x3 corresponds to, the x corresponds to. And then I want to see how this will change over time. Okay. All right. So what I've done here is sh showed you, there's my initial condition. I'm showing you what the iteration is using this equation. For different values of, of course, I changed the notation again on you. Um, delta t, I'll fix this. Okay, H and delta t are the s same thing. So I just want to show you what this looks like, depending on how you pick this step size, right? Because I've been making the argument small is better. So I'm going to pick these different values here for the step size, meaning delta t or H, same thing. Okay. And so if you crank through this equation with this initial condition and this value of, of delta t or h of 0.5, you get the solution that looks like this. Okay. So in other words, the interpretation is that if delta t is, let's say, let's say the time scale here is hours or minutes. Let's say minutes, OK? Then this is the value of, of the value x3 at um, 0.05 minutes. This is 0.1 minutes, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, OK? So that's what you get for 0 0.05. Here's what you get for 0.1. You can see they're not the same. They're going the same place, it looks like, but they're not getting there the same way, OK? You have to be a little careful because um, maybe I should make this a little bit clear. Well, maybe it's not so clear. So just so you understand what I'm generating here, let me show you for like this h equal 0.1, what does this mean? So here's h, here's time, here's 0. OK, at 0, it's at the value 0, because that's the initial condition. 
Then at n equal 1, which means 0.1 time units, whatever the time units are, the value is 0.9. So here's 0 0.1, and then I guess about here, 0 0.9. There is a value right there. Okay? Then the next value I did was 0 0.2. That corresponds to n equal 2, and that number is 1.26. So obviously I'm not going to draw this well to scale. You, you already know this about me, okay? So that's somewhere like up here, okay? And then at 0 0.3, which is the um, n equal 3, what is it? 1.4, basically. So I don't know. Up here. So these are increments of 0.1 because that's what h is, okay? And so that means you think the solution looks something like this get the idea? And it's going to, I think, 1.5. It's going to 1.5 because 1.5 is the steady state for this system. So you're starting it with no, you know, it has none of the component in there, and then you're mixing the two streams, and it's eventually going to the steady state composition, which is 1.5. Okay? All right. So I'm just ma making the point here that you can't compare the solution here with the solution here because this one corresponds to the value at 0.05, and this one corresponds at 0.1. So you have to plot them all versus time, and then you could compare them. You can't compare them in terms of n. Okay. Now, you can start to see some, some, so let's say you think this is good, and that's what the solution looks like. So if you were to plot these two versus each other, which I probably should have done, but I didn't, you'd see they're similar. Something weird starts happening here, right? Because the first value is 0.225, so now it's doing something like this. I think it, it does come back to 1.5, right? So when this h is what? 0.25, you start at 0. And then the first point here, which is, I think, 0.25, is way up here somewhere, right? And then does it oscillate around? Yeah. So it's doing something that looks a little bit like this. So that means it's doing this. That's not real. In other words, that's not the behavior of the real system. That's the behavior of your numerical method. You, you, see, the, you see the distinction? Okay. Like the real system looks like that. You don't have any in. You mix up. It goes exponentially to the steady state. That's how the real system works. The real system doesn't do this. So that's why it's important to understand something about numerical methods, because you wouldn't want to turn this in as your solution to a tank mixing. <laughs> Because this has nothing to do with dynamics or the system behavior of the real system. It's everything to do with your numerical method is bad. Your numerical method is bad because H is too big here. Okay. And if you, if you go for H even bigger, it gets even worse. You can see now it's oscillating around. Now these oscillations are actually growing. Now you've concluded the mixing is an unstable process, <laughs> which it's not. Okay. So, the main thing I wanted to impart here was two things. First of all, just how you implement one of these and what it means, you know, in this sense. But also, the choice of this H is critical. You go from what's probably a really accurate solution to one that's maybe not as accurate to one that's oscillatory but shouldn't be and one that's unstable, which definitely shouldn't be. Okay, so it makes a big difference to choose it properly. Okay. I'm a better person than I thought. <laughs> you see, remember I said I probably should have, but I didn't? I probably should have, and I did, okay, is the answer. Um, so what I did was I plotted all these solutions. So I iterated, because I got a lot of free time, apparently. I iterated each of these equations that looks like um, for 20 time units. No, just n. Okay, so this is plotted just versus n, not time. So, so you can see for um, the small dt, or h, or whatever you want to call it, it looks like this. For the slightly bigger one, it looks like this. N here does not mean the same thing, you understand? These increments in N are smaller than these. This corresponds to a time unit of 0.05, and this is 0.1. So, but they both look not too bad. Here's the one where you, st you know, the one I kind of tried. I did a pretty good job, unusually so, for me. Um, so it starts oscillating, and this one, it looks this way, because look at the scale. It's, it's getting very large. So these two are just flat wrong. This is probably inaccurate. This is probably a little bit inaccurate. Like, if I were to really solve this myself, I'd probably take dt equal 0.0001. Why take any chances? Okay. 
So again, the step size d it takes you from a, a solution that makes a lot of sense and is probably very close to being the true solution to one that's absolutely wrong. Okay. So one thing you'd like to avoid, I hope you agree, is something like this. That's, that's really bad, right? So you can come up with methods that are kind of more stable than this. The method we just talked about is called the forward Euler method, okay? And there's also something called a backward Euler method, which I'm going to explain to you now that has better properties. So here is one way to explain the forward Euler method. It's just an alternative to the way I explained it to you at the beginning, okay? You have a differential equation like this, you want to solve it, okay? Another way to interpret how you pose this equation, I've already given it to you, is, is this way. Take this derivative and approximate it like this, right? This looks like the definition of the derivative, right? If, if h is really small, then this, so this is two subsequent values of y that are se se uh, separated by h, and so this is an approximation of the derivative. If h is really small, it's a good approximation. If h goes to zero, it's a definition of the derivative, right? So I'm just taking two subsequent values, subtract them, dividing it by h, okay? And that's an approximation of this derivative. And then on the right-hand side, I'm evaluating x and y at the point n. And then if you manipulate this equation by multiple cross by h, and then adding y n to both sides of the equation, you get the same equation you had before. It's just an alternative way of deriving it. It's the same exact equation, no different, okay? Now, if we look at this equation, one thing we like about it is that if I give you x, n, and y, n, you can explicitly calculate y, n plus 1, okay? So in other words, if I give you the initial condition x, 0, y, 0, you can explicitly calculate y, 1. Uh, this is called an explicit method for that reason, okay? So there's other things called implicit methods, and the imp simplest one of that is this backward Euler. So let's say you do the same thing here as you did here, but instead of evaluating everything at the right-hand side at n, you evaluate it at n plus 1, okay? Then you can write the equation, instead of looking like that, it looks like this. Okay. So to solve this equation, I give you x, I give you yn, right? You know what xn plus 1 is because you know all the x's because you're choosing the step size and you know what x's are. Now you have to solve this equation for yn plus 1 and it appears there and it appears there in this nonlinear function. This is a nonlinear algebraic equation now for y, right? That's an explicit function of yn plus 1. This is an implicit function. So this is easier to solve. It's explicit. This, you have to solve a nonlinear algebraic equation every time you do this. You might say, well, that's, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Um, the reason is, is because these methods that are implicit work much better, OK? Um, they're much more stable, which I guess I will show you at some point soon. Um, so the, the implicit methods are inherently more stable, okay? They avoid this kind of stuff like this, okay? The, but there's, it's, there's no free lunch. You've got to pay for it by each time you iterate this equation. You have to solve a nonlinear algebra equation, so solve for y, okay? And they, large, they allow you to use larger step sizes. So if people are, you know, no one would ever use this method here for reasons I just showed you because you can get any of these answers and you don't know when you're going to get them, right? Like, you don't know what the appropriate step size is, and if you choose the wrong one, you get the totally wrong answer, and that's not a very palatable situation, so you'd like to avoid that. Okay. So, you can use these backward Eulers, which are te tend to be a lot more stable and much preferred, okay? Or, generally speaking, they're called implicit methods, okay? Now, I have to decide if I actually, I'm not going to do this now, um, actually, I will, <laughs> I will do it now. <laughs> so I, can, I had two choices, right? Will I do this at all, or will I do it later? And so the answer was, I'll do it now. Okay. All right. So let's, we got to finish on time, because I'm a stickler for that, because I want coffee. All right. So this is an example of a problem that I remember I wowed you with because we did a differential balance on this little strip delta z here, and we derived this equation. So, so for now, this is a so-called plug flow reactor. You'll learn about this in kinetics. You feed in material at the beginning of the reactor. Reaction A goes to B takes place along the length of this reactor. Concentration of A decreases along the length. Concentration of B increases along the length. 
and then you extract the product from the end of the reactor here. Okay? And so you get a differential equation like this. We derive this. I won't belabor it any further here. This gives you a differential equation for the concentration of the reactant A as it changes along the length of this reactor. It involves the flow rate of material into the reactor, the cross-sectional area of the reactor, and the reaction rate constant for that reaction. Okay? So let's just say you have this equation. You have this equation and you have some initial condition for it and you want to solve it. Okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to solve it numerically and I'm going to solve it analytically and then I'm going to show the two converge to each other. But only if you use an implicit, implicit method to do it numerically. So let's say first of all we want to solve it numerically. Okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to approximate this derivative using these so-called finite differences. Right? We're going to take a value of CA, two subsequent values separated by a distance delta Z, and we're going to divide by delta Z, and that's our approximation of the slope right there, just like we did on the previous page. Okay? And then because I want to make this method backward or so-called implicit, I'm going to evaluate this value CA here at the point N plus 1 instead of the point N. If it was point N, it would be explicit, point N plus 1 implicit. Okay? Now, I'm lucky in this case because the equation is linear to begin with. I can just gather these two terms, right? Here I said this will be require solving a nonlinear algebraic equation. Well, not if the function f is linear. In this case, it's linear, so now I can just take the two terms involving ca, n, um, CA at zn plus 1 there and there and gather them together, which I did, and then I divided through and I got this thing. Just, this, just solving this nonlinear algebra, I mean, linear algebraic equation for ca right here, there and there in terms of this one at Zn, and you'll get this, okay? So to use this equation, it's an inner of equation, right? I give you the initial condition. You plug that value in here. I give you all these numbers here. You crank through, and then you get the value at the, va the concentration of Ca at the point Z1. Then you take that point, plug it in over here, and then you get the concentration at Z2, and so on and so forth. And obviously, if, well, maybe it's not obvious, but um, Hopefully you can see that if I do this n times, I'll get an equation that looks like this. Right? Take the initial concentration, and all I'm going to do is keep multiplying by this term. So if I want to know what happens if I iterate this equation n times, capital N times, it looks like this. Okay. If I want to know what the concentration of Zn is, it's just this thing raised to the n power times the initial condition. Just like saying, it's nothing more than saying the following. If you had an equation that looks like this, then ah, sorry. You see what I'm doing here? So I have a simple equation, iterative equation that looks like this. So if I start off with a point y0, I can get a point y1. If I want to know what y2 is, I just do it again. But since I already know what y1 is in terms of y0, I can plug that in. It'll be a squared. And if I do this n times, it'll be yn equal a to the n power. And that's all I've done here. a is this big thing here, but it's the same thing. Okay. So that's my numerical solution using an implicit Euler method. Okay. Now, I hope you know this. If you have, this is a separable differential equation, right? So you can t take this thing, separate and integrate it, apply the initial condition, and the solution will look like this, right? This is an equation that looks like the following.